quick notes. Uh, it's some feedback from the store of yesterday, a lot of good discussion. Uh, I hope that it, it highlighted some issues with the material we've been covering over the last week and has helped you put it in perspective. Just a quick comment. The spreadsheets that are, or oh, sorry, the examples I have in the, in the course notes are all available in a spreadsheet online on the course website. So if you click on the link and take it to a Google Doc, the Google Doc has multiple tabs, each tab related to a section of the course. And you can go and see the detailed calculations that were used in that example. So if you're not quite sure how to reproduce the values up on the slides, um, you can always go look at that to see how I generate those figures. And then the, the figures in the, in the spreadsheet are labeled according to the slide number. So strongly recommend you reproduce the examples in the notes. If you can't, if you get stuck, take a look at that as a solution to see how to go about it. Another topic that uh, caused some problems yesterday, and it's partly my fault because the slides that I had here were a little bit unclear on this point, were what's eligible and what's a non-eligible expense. So when we're talking about non-eligible expenses, those are expenses that are going to be depreciated later on. So we want to be clear with including the correct values and all the amounts we can expense so that we can reduce our taxes. So we need to be quite clear on what we can and cannot depreciate. This is the characteristics of items that the government allows us to depreciate. There are items which are used to produce income um, and or costs that are related to producing income. There, there are things that have life longer than a year and they lose value over time. So in that category then, non-eligible expenses obviously includes the equipment itself. So on the next slide after this, you have two boxes showing eligible and non-eligible expenses. Let's just add to that or make sure that your copy is up to date. Non-eligible expenses are the equipment cost itself. But then installation and shipping are both In fact, if you insure the product during shipping as well, so you're shipping maybe by ocean or airline, you wish to insure that, that shipment of that, that valuable capital item you're, you're buying from Germany or from Japan. As is often the case with companies, we're ordering very high-tech reactors and high-tech components from foreign countries like Germany and Japan. You, you will want to insure that during transportation, so even that's valid. So installation, shipping, and insurance of that item can be um, expensed as a non-eligible non expense. The preparation for your land and buildings. So when I've purchased capital equipment, we've had to bang holes through the side of the building to get that piece of equipment into the, into the area, just because the building wasn't designed for such a large opening. So we had to break holes into the building. That cost of fixing the land and fixing the building to get the equipment in place it's also about part of your installation. Yes. Um, if you say you're paying your like your workers in your plant, and you're paying them the money the operation, and then you bring in a piece of equipment, you're paying help and part of their job is to install this equipment for say six months. Right. Um, is that is like normally the salaries go under eligible expenses. But so for the period of time that they're employed on this task, that's a non-eligible expense. So the contractors you bring in to uncrate and unbox. If we had to bring in all people who are specialized in uncreating and unboxing, we couldn't just allow our normal staff to do it. They get paid, um, and that's a non-eligible expense. Yes, please. What if you purchase land? Is that eligible or non-eligible? Thoughts on that? Yeah, Right, so it's a, land is an eligible expense, it does not lose its value over time. So land is never depreciated. So what happens is that we add up all our non-eligible expenses, we can sum them up, and that's going to equal the book value. Okay, and this is what's, what's perhaps confusing to people, is that installation and shipping and land building improvements, let's make sure that this is correct here, land building improvements, those get summed up and that gets added into the book value. So your equipment doesn't just cost what you pay the vendor for it, 
it's the cost of all these items together make up the book value. And that's the value you go ahead and depreciate for the subsequent years. So it seems counterintuitive. Why can I depreciate installation shipping? Well, they do have value. They're used to get this equipment in place so that you can start producing income. And that, that, that value that that shipping and installation and so forth is providing is going to have a lasting value greater than a year. In fact, the value of that shipping, insurance, those improvements you're making are going to have the same lifetime as the equipment itself. And so it makes sense to wrap all those values up into a single number, the book value, and write it off over a period of time through depreciation. Sorry, um, so land can't be depreciated if the building is here? Uh, land, let's emphasize this, land and building improvements. So you maybe need to do get the bulldozer in to do some landscaping to get this land flattened out for the new piece of building. But the cost of the land is, is not included in here. The modification of the land is. So it's the cost of the buildings depreciated? The buildings can always be depreciated, yeah. But here we're talking about making improvements to the building to get that equipment in there. The, another category that goes here is, for example, the design, engineering, safety analysis. So all of that has an operability studies, which we're going to start looking at in, in two weeks from now. Uh, all of those, those engineers and, and contractors you're paying, uh, that gets rolled up as well as people tell. Yeah. Patent royalties. So I would argue no, patent royalties would not go in here because the patent royalties, the way licenses for patents are usually written up are so that they're proportional to your production. So if you produce nothing, you don't get, you don't pay patent royalties. The moment you start producing, you pay patent royalties. So a patent royalty would be in something like a salary or a utility. It's, it's something that you pay in proportion to your production. And so that's an eligible expense. The next thing about depreciation is your book value gets summed up, but you don't get to depreciate it until the day you turn your equipment on to produce product. So the two, three years that might be taking you to get that equipment up and running, you're doing plant trials, you're doing commissioning, you're finding operating conditions that work well on this new equipment. That duration of time, you don't get to write off the depreciation. Only the day you flip the switch to start producing product to sell to customers, that's when depreciation can start being put in. So there's a timing aspect there to that as well. So the cost of those, yeah, to get, because that's really part of this, this item here, of getting the equipment installed. So contractors and so forth, to get the equipment installed is all, all rolled up into the book value. So the next thing I'd like to just point out about depreciation that uh, will, will help here is, let's just take a look at this uh, diagram again. We have here that the book value is the first number on the, on the period. That's the sum that we've just calculated over here. Now what I'd like you to notice is that this is zero down here on this axis. So zero dollars up to my book value dollars. Over a long period of time, this the amount of depreciation you write off in subsequent periods will eventually add up to, or pretty much for all intents and purposes, add up to the book value. So, so what we're seeing then is that the sum of all the depreciations over a long period of time will add up to the book value. So you eventually get to write off that total expense that you paid right at the beginning over there. So all these installations, equipment costs, and so forth. That total expense then gets written off over a number of years. So this will help you understand the one question in the assignment where you, you're asking to consider the situation where there's no depreciation when versus what depreciation is doing. Depreciation is simply taking your total costs and instead of being able to expense them in one go, in one period, which the government does not allow, they allow you to use this fictitious cash amount called depreciation and just spread out the value of that over a number of years. Okay, so that's how some people like to see depreciation. 
as just a way to fairly expense uh, the cost of an item over the period of time it's spent. Another way that people like to see depreciation is that this amount that the government's allowing you to write off and you pay less tax on is really just a mechanism for you to have a forced savings account to replace that equipment in a few years' time. So some people consider depreciation as a way of forced deferred maintenance. Um, so they see that as a cash flow, as it were, to help save for replacing that equipment afterwards. I don't like that perspective of thinking it because depreciation is not a cash flow. There's no time value of money associated with it. So that's another important point that people were asking yesterday. Depreciation in future years, do I need to take time value of money into account on that dollar figure? No, you don't get to do that. Depreciation is not a cash flow. There's no time value of money to it. It's not a physical amount of money that's changing hands. Okay, so depreciation then was uh, simply that value that's in the bubble that we had on a few slides back. Um, Depreciation then is simply a number that's internal to the system. Only these values flowing into and out of there are, are cash flow. So revenues flowing in, costs and expenditures flowing out, and then taxes is a, is a cash flow that's flowing out. Depreciation is simply an internal number that affects that cash flow, but depreciation is not a cash flow in and of itself. So we don't get to take time value of money into account on it. The way uh, we can emphasize that was with this example we looked at in the class of Friday. Notice that what we do is we calculate our revenues, our expenses, our book values and depreciation, and then taxable income, which we had up here in column F. Once we know how much taxable income we have, we pay our tax, and then we calculate this column H. This is the, probably the most important column in the table. It's showing me all my money flowing in minus my money flowing out and includes, column H, includes the money flowing out due to eligible and non-eligible expenses. Let's just emphasize that here in this uh, prior slide where we had that H as my net cash flow includes my income A plus non-eligible, uh, plus eligible expenses B plus non-eligible expenses C minus the taxes paid. So this is just the most important number from a company's perspective is really their bank balance at the end of the period. That's your cash that you have available to you in your bank account. All your money flowing in, minus eligible and non-eligible expenses. So from the bank account's perspective, it's an expense, whether it's eligible or not, it gets subtracted out, minus the taxes paid. That's your amount of money in your, that you have available to you. And that's the amount of money that gets TBN. You don't, you don't apply time value of money to these items separately. Okay? Some people were trying to do that in the tutorial. They say, don't apply time value of money to, your, to these entries separately. Simply calculate the net cash flow and then apply one time value of money onto that amount. Okay, that way, um, you'll, you'll definitely get these, these, these sorts of problems solved correctly. So always, always set them up just in a spreadsheet, many columns or many rows, depending on which way you want to work. And apply the time value of money to this column H. Now the other thing that people sometimes make a mistake on is they apply time value of money to the cumulative cash flow. Don't do that. Take just the net cash flow within the period. So this is one period's cash flow. This is the next period's cash flow. The net cash flow within a period. Apply time value of money to that amount and put it over there. So that 14,000 then is discounted to 12. 13,000 discounts to 10, 12 discounts to 9. And then have side by side to these columns, you have two additional columns that just keep accumulations going. So keep these four extra columns you have are standard at the end. The net cash flow, cumulative cash flow, net cash flow accounting for time value of money, and then net cash flow accounting for time value of money, cumulative. So just tack on those four columns at the end. Yeah, and then that, this is what we go ahead and plot to visualize our time value of money cash flow. We use this to determine our payback time 
from the cumulative cash flow, and we use this uh, to calculate whether we break even or not in terms of NPV. So that's the purpose of these, these extra columns at the end, is to then go ahead and calculate our profitability. Okay, questions, comments on that? Anything that's uncertain? That's the 5,000 is like maintenance? Is that what maintenance? In this example, I believe the 5,000 was maintenance, right? So it's, a, then it's like a labor expense? That's right. Okay, yeah, so that's in column B. Maintenance is an eligible. Why are negative taxes paid counted as a cash flow? Okay, why are negative taxes paid as a cash flow? They're, they're treated as a cash flow. Why is it as a cash flow? Okay, so negative taxes do exist. If you get a negative tax, the government hands you a check. Now, we have that from our refunds, right? We know that from our personal taxes. It works the same for corporate taxes, except it's not quite like that. Companies don't receive a check. What they do, though, what they do is they get a credit that they can carry forward to the next year. That's the more accurate way of seeing it. For our intensive purposes, though, it works quite adequately to assume it's a negative cash flow with the government paying you that money. You don't account for the credit to the future year. The reason why that works well for us in engineering systems is when we're doing this analysis, it's for one project. Companies have multiple things on the go. So this credit that we get for one project will cancel out the tax on another project. So at the end, the company will still end up paying taxes for the corporate year. But for, a, for our evaluation perspective, considering negative taxes of income flowing into the system is quite a, and, and, and a fair way of looking. So some people are always tempted when they see a negative tax pay, they just put a zero there instead. Uh, don't do that, just account for it as a negative. Okay, that's all I had to make comments on. Um, anything else? Any other questions or doubts? Yeah. Um, regarding the book value starting when you install, or when you start writing the book, uh, Process. Right. Um, so does the book value then, if, if your installation takes two years, is, the, is there a book value for that first year, or is it just the sum? Right, so the book value is a number that simply just keeps track of how much you've not depreciated, essentially, so that's all it's doing, okay? So the most important thing from a cash flow perspective is the depreciation amount, not the book value amount. So in the case where it's taking multiple periods to install the equipment, uh, it doesn't really matter how you account for the book value. The, as long as you get the total book value correct on the day or at the, in the period that you're turning the equipment on for cost purposes. So whether you choose to report half the book values because you're spraying it over two years or one third, if you're spraying it over three years, whatever the case, it doesn't really matter. The only thing that matters is that the book value is the right number on the day you turn on the Okay, so let's move on then from that example, and I just quickly would like to emphasize that there are other types of depreciation. So prior uh, years in this course, we would look at straight line depreciation, double declining balance depreciation, we'd look at some US type style depreciations for those of you that work in the United States or companies that have US offices. Um, I really don't focus on that too much for the main reason that it's, it's almost these, these other types of depreciations are almost exceptional, okay? If you look at the CRA website, there's multiple classes of depreciation. I think about two or three of those classes use what's called straight line depreciation, which simply says exactly what the name is. It's depreciating the equipment in equal increments over a period of time. So the CRA tells you what time frame you can use. Usually it's a four year period and you get to write off the capital cost of the equipment over that period of time in simply a straight line decline. So our previous slide that we had, you saw the sort of exponential decay on the book value. With the straight line method, it's literally just that. It's a, it's a, hard, a diagonal line, the declining balance of the book value. And there's a, there's a trivial example. The CRA, if you read up on the classes on, the, on their website, they give examples as well. So, you're interested in that. So it's almost an exceptional case 
Um, and so I'm not going to focus on that in this course too much. But you will see this terminology sometime, perhaps, depending on where you end up working. For those of you that will end up working in big companies like Hatch or uh, some of the oil companies where you're moving around the world in, in different countries, it's always worthwhile finding out what corporate tax rates are in different parts of the world. That's an interesting exercise to do. It's very easy to find that information. Um, you can also consider uh, the effect of cash flow on tax when the depreciated good is sold for a price different from its book value. So, what this is essentially asking you to do is consider what salvage is. Now, here in this course, again, I don't consider salvage too much. Salvage is just the value you get for your equipment at the end of its life when you choose to sell it. The reason why I simply avoid salvage is because if you're relying on the salvage value to make your project profitable, there's all sorts of other issues that you've got a problem with. So, um, so salvage is almost never something that should be used to be making a decision on whether to go for a project or not. Except there's one case when you've got very, very short-term projects that last a year or two. Okay. Then salvage is important and, and worthwhile to consider. But for longer-term projects, which most of us will consider, yes, um, salvage should not be an issue. Um, there's, there's some fine details there between MARR before and after tax that can be, can be modified. This uh, topic on number four, we spoke about depreciation during the first year. There's a 50% rule, and there's all sorts of games companies play with uh, when they choose to start depreciating their equipment. If, um, if you have a short term or a short term project, would you have to look at the difference between like, leasing that piece of equipment and buying it and then selling it afterwards? Or is that something you should take into consideration? So the question here is uh, if you've got a short term project, consider perhaps leasing versus buying. Um, I will probably have a question on that in the next tutorial assignment for you to try out. It's a, it's a common question that comes up in your own life when you start choosing whether to buy a car or lease a car. Right? All the same issues um, will show up. For buy a house versus rent, um, those are all, all the common, common situations. And the answer is there is no correct way of doing it. And that's why leasing versus buying works so well for different people and not so well for others. Um, but absolutely, that, that is a consideration for leasing versus buying. The, the key advantage of leasing is what? Leasing a piece of equipment versus buying it. But why would companies lease rather than buy? They don't have to take ownership. They don't have to pay tax on it. They don't have to take ownership. They don't have to pay tax on, on, on maintenance and oh, sorry, not the maintenance liability. So they have no maintenance, but that also means they don't get to write off the expense of yeah. maintenance. But they do get to write off the expense of leasing it. So that's that's one advantage is that you can get this piece of equipment and expense it because it's now a lease and not a capital item that you own. So there's there's an interesting twist there. Um, in cases where you actually just can't afford to put up all the money up, if that's the case, then leasing you could do it in monthly payments. Right, you don't just have you don't have the initial capital outlay to spend. Um, so you don't get to depreciate with leasing, but you do get to expense it. So there, if there's that, you don't pay maintenance. You just call someone else in to maintain it. So that may have an advantage for you. You may not have the capability in house to maintain it. So. Um, so those are those are obvious advantages and disadvantages, and that's why there's no correct answer what works and what doesn't work. Uh, there's different types of depreciation percentages. So rapid depreciation with a high percentage versus a slow percentage. You saw that in some of the classes, uh, CRAs classes allow very very rapid depreciation, high percentages of 50 percent. Uh, there's one class that's even 100 percent. So CRA in one time frame allowed companies to depreciate the equipment very rapidly, essentially expensing it all within one period as a mechanism to encourage them to invest in capital replacement. And this was a, in the period from 2008 to 2010, 11, 12, some of the still ongoing to for the, uh, the depression, well not depression, but recession I should say. Um, so during that recessionary period we had four five years ago, CRA created some new classes to allow rapid depreciation. Why did they do that? 
And what benefit does that have, have on the cash flows is something that you should consider. Okay, um, this is that's related to entry number six over here, and then income taxes, uh, negative income taxes we spoke about earlier. Okay, so let's look at the next topic in this course, uh, estimation of costs. We're going to come back a bit more to point number three, comparing alternatives later, but I just wanted to take a, deep, uh, a look here at estimating costs first, and then we'll, we'll look at um, Okay, so Simcrude, who's worked? In the oil sands, who's worked at Simcrude, perhaps? Anyone? Anyone worked in the oil sands? A few people know this name. So Simcrude is a big player in the oil sands. Um, they're a major source of oil for Western Canada, and they're a major employer in that region. Here's an interesting situation they found themselves in a few years ago. They had this massive expansion project they were working on. Their initial estimate was $3.6 billion for the capital costs. A few years later, they revised that to 4.6, then to 5.1, and it finally ended up costing $8.4 billion. Okay, so big, big number. What's the total revenue income for Ontario? How much taxes does the Ontario government have in their budget as their income? 120 billion. Ontario's deficit right now is around 10 billion. So this, just this upgrade, costs in the order of what Ontario's deficit is right now. So it's a big, big amount of money. It's a big misjudgment as well, going from 3.6 to 8.4 billion. How did they get their costs um, so, so poorly estimated? So we, what we're looking at in this section is how we estimate those capital costs. It's not going to prevent us from this problem. Uh, where pr projects usually kind of grow in scope and costs increase over time. That's something that uh, will almost always happen. But that's, a, that's an excessive situation. Here's another one, uh, Suncorp. They just canceled their 11.6 billion uh, upgraded project because of soaring capital costs. So this is a press release on the Global Mail uh, earlier in March. You can go click on the hyperlink and read it for yourself. Um, their belief is that better profits are to be found by shipping unprocessed bitumen. So this upgrader was going to process some of that. They've then realized that it's not economically profitable to do this processing. They'd rather make uh, money by shipping out unprocessed bitumen. What did that cost them? Well, there's $140 million right down right this last quarter. That's a small amount of money. But then $1.5 billion was written off in February. That's a huge amount of money. They've already invested 3.5 billion into this project. So 3.5 out of 11.6 billion was invested and they've had to write that down. So they're writing it down over a number of quarters and they probably will get to reuse some of that equipment that they've already bought. But this is an interesting statement, typical CEO speak, to allocate capital with priority given to developing higher return growth projects. So they're simply saying we've decided to scrap this project and reinvest our money elsewhere because we can make more money elsewhere. Is really what they're saying. Okay. But what has happened here is that for two, three years, a huge number of engineers were focusing on this project, spending their time and effort on this, and then it gets cancelled. Not just that within the company, but there's a ripple effect beyond the company itself and all this of their suppliers. So getting these estimates right and what we're going to look at after that is a sensitivity analysis to look at what if, what if. What if the economy changes in the future? What if our costs are, are going to be greater than what we anticipated? And understanding the economics of a project is, is really critical. <coughs> we don't want to be working in a company where this is happening to us. It really isn't a pleasant situation. Uh, so we, if we're in a company and we're spending large capital dollars, we want to be able to estimate those costs correctly at the very least, and then do a proper sensitivity analysis to make sure our estimates are robust to uncertainty. Okay, so that's what we're going to look at over the next week or so. So here's, here's another topic uh, related to, to it. Um, we need the skill. To, to estimate. 
contact with cost. But a, a lot of times people just say, well, I could just phone up the supplier of the pump. Well, I can just phone up the supplier of the distillation column or the separator and ask them for a quote. And that way I'll get an accurate cost. Right? Why do I need to go do all the work we're going to look at in the next few slides to estimate these capital costs? I can just simply phone someone up and have them do it, do the work for me and give me the dollar figure. Okay? Without looking at your notes, which is obviously the next slide, can you think of a few ideas why this might not be a suitable thing to be doing? So just discuss with the person next to you why um, why it should be useful to be able to estimate that cost and not just phone up the supplier. <laughs> 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 evaluate these bids so that we can judge whether they're fair or not. There's also sometimes, well not sometimes, in many projects in fact, there's this confidentiality. So if you start to request bids from multiple suppliers, 
they're going to talk amongst themselves and they're going to talk to their other customers and say, well, you know, company A came to us and wanted us to bid on this project. Did you know that A is doing such and such? And then B suddenly knows about your, your plans via your supplier. Okay, so non-disclosure agreements are not, which non-disclosure agreements are never worth the paper they're written on pretty much, as you'll quickly come to appreciate. Um, people still talk. So when a project really is confidential, you must be able to evaluate costs without talking to a vendor. Um, there's, there's an implied intention of contract in some cases with um, asking for quotes. It's, it's obviously not, not that explicit, but um, it may, you may mislead the supplier to thinking that you, you're actually purchasing from them, which is an ethical um, issue. And then there's the, the project is much greater than just what the quotes are that you're receiving. There's, there's piping, there's installation, there's electrical, there's plumbing, there's, there's, there's all sorts of hookups onto the equipment that are required and those are not easily estimated from the vendor. The vendor is going to give you a price for the heat exchanger, for example, but there's all sorts of other materials and, and costs associated with getting that, that equipment going. So we're going to look at some of that, and we need to estimate those costs as well. Okay, so it's not just the cost of the, the unit itself, but the whole package around it. So we're going to call that the bare module, and I'm going to show you what that looks like um, perhaps in the next class. So just a quick, um, a quick discussion on, on the different levels of detail we go to for our cost estimates. We can look at this very crude flow sheet where we've got this idea of converting toluene uh, to uh, toluene and hydrogen, combine them up, react them together. There's a separation step here, there's a distillation column step when we produce benzene and, and some other gases. So this is a very, very crude conceptual flow sheet that you've seen in your second year courses. We could start to look at very basic order of magnitude costs based on this. There's correlations that we might use, but this is probably not detailed enough for us to get started. What we can use from this is the fact that we've got this amount of toluene coming in, so we can estimate raw material costs, we can estimate product costs, we can sell this for on the market. And then I will show you a formula that we can use. Once we know what we can sell our product for, there's a formula that can give us a very crude estimate for what this should be costing us based on the general engineering area. So once you know how much money you can be making from your product, you can, to a very, very poor extent, estimate the capital costs in there. And those, the errors on that capital cost are huge. They're at least 100%. Right? So it's not a very useful estimate, but it gives you a ballpark. Right? Now, guess where we're going to be working at in this course is where you've got a, a more detailed flow sheet. You know that you've got your feed, but it's coming into a vessel now. You're going to need some pumps, two of them in fact, heat exchangers, there's a fire heater, there's a reactor over here. We, we, we'll know the type of reactor that this is. There's a compressor, there's another heat exchanger, and then here's our columns. Some, some flash drums, and there's our distillation column, there's some more heat exchangers, there's all sorts of valves in the piping, and, and vessels and pumps. Okay? This is the level of detail we're going to look at. And then on Friday's class, uh, Dr. Adams is going to be giving the class, and he's going to be introducing the course project for 4N. We're going to use a flow sheet from 3G, he's going to come give a lecture on it, and we're going to be using that as our basis for the project for this course. So Friday's class is really important as the first class, uh, the first introduction to the, into the project of this course. And we're going to be looking at things in this, at this level. Now we could go ahead and kick it up a notch and start looking up far more detailed information. So we can even start adding control loops. We've got specifications of mass flows, uh, temperatures, pressures on the different streams. Um, in fact, I would argue that our project we're going to be looking at is somewhere in between this level of detail and this level of detail. So um, the ASCII flow sheet that you'll be working from is, is fairly detailed. Then we can go even further still, and this is where you start to get your capital costs estimated within about a 10-15% bracket. Right, this is really, really detailed engineering. You sunk a lot of money into your project when you get a flow sheet of this level of complexity. You probably spent, um, for a project of this scope, probably a good 
500,000, maybe a million dollars already just on planning and preliminary engineering to get to this stage. So then it's quite acceptable to spend a huge chunk of time and money to investigate what the capital cost of this flow should be. This is certainly not the level of detail we'll be going to, but this is the level of detail that you would need uh, when companies need to start writing checks and issuing budgets to, to, to your, your group. Okay, so here's, here's the level of detail we see it at. Uh, we'll look at this first order of magnitude step. Uh, those are very good for just screening alternatives. You use the block flow diagram. Once you've sort of settled on a type of technology that you're going to use, then you start to go to this level of detail. I even argue that these numbers are a little bit too too small. Like these are they're pretty wide still. Um, and then the final diagram I just showed, that's where you've got your errors down to about 5% to 15%. You've got the process control loops on there already, uh, very detailed piping and instrumentation has been decided. Okay. And the cost of just estimating at this level, the cost of that estimation will cost easily $100,000. But that's okay, because we get to write it off as a capital cost, remember? Uh, all this work and engineering we do up front, we get to write it off into the book value. So that's, uh, that's a, an advantage over there. Now, there's temptation to say, well, you know what, Aspen's Icarus or capital cost estimation uh, software can do this all for me. Right? So you, have you used that in 3G? Yeah. So click the button and it gives you all these numbers, right? That's great. So let's not spend the next two weeks understanding how these correlations work. Well, we, we should do that. The level of detail, the level of work required to get to that, that very high fidelity simulation is substantial. Okay? We can get those capital cost estimates fairly easily. And we should also understand how Aspen is doing this. Okay, so we the correlations that are built into Aspen are actually use a lot of the material that Don Woods developed here at Mac. So if you're familiar with Don Woods' name, I've mentioned his name in the class before. His correlations we're going to be looking at in over the next few classes are the subs are, are a lot of the substance in <coughs> online computer software capital cost estimators. The software estimators are enhanced by more up-to-date information from quotes from vendors, but the basis for them is still from work that was done here at Mac. So when he passed away, actually, his wife uh, phoned me up and I inherited 20 boxes of his books. And it's quite interesting paging through all his raw material that he used to write up his books on this, because he's got all the drawings that we're going to see over the next few classes, all in pencil. And what he did was, over the years, he got quotes from all sorts of companies. Like, all these boxes are just him writing to multiple companies and getting actual quotes and then drawing these diagrams to calculate the coefficients we're going to see. So it's a, it's really, when we're looking at this, people, the first criticism is like this is all out of date, like you'll see the dates are 1970s. But don't be mistaken, Aspen's baseline for these calculations is exactly the same data and they just scale it up to today's values. So we're going to be doing the same. We're going to consider the cost of building this process in the 1970s and then just scale it up to today's dollars. Okay, so here's a diagram in Don Woods' uh, handwriting that talks about what we've just discussed. We've got our feasibility analysis, we've explored different alternatives, and we're doing very crude estimates here at this level. So I'm gonna talk about that. And then we start to go to more detailed design and sizing diagrams, and then we're gonna calculate what's called these FOV costs, so free on board costs, and then we're going to consider modules. And our capital cost estimates are going to be in the order of 30 to 40 percent. And then it's at this stage that we're going to uh, stop. We're going to say, essentially what we're choosing is, are we going to go ahead with this project, yes or no? That's the level of detail for our course, is simply to decide whether this project is worthwhile or not. Once you've decided it's worthwhile, then you go into those more detailed piping and instrumentation diagrams. And, um, you take it up to a much higher level of detail. I'll skip over that slide. It's, um, it's more just for your reference to show how capital costs are very high in error at the initial stage. And then as you progress to more and more detail, um, 
information. So the dots indicate the pieces of information you do know. So initially, all we know is very basic information on just what the product production capacity is and where this process is going to be located. Is it in North America, South America, so forth. So if you know just that information, you can get a very crude estimate with large error. And as you know more and more information, uh, those dot, the more dots there are, it means you know more information, your errors, your error balance come in narrower and narrower. So you can go read up what the most detailed information might look like. So where we are then is um, there's two types of costs we should be aware of. There's capital costs and then there's operating costs or manufacturing costs. We're focusing on this section. Capital costs are the actual pieces of equipment we're going to install. We're also going to have a section next week where we consider manufacturing costs, so salaries. How many operators do you need? How much should operators be paid? Um, how much is that labor costing you? What is, are utilities costing you? Steam, water, electricity, so forth. Uh, we'll consider that next week. This week we're considering uh, capital items. Okay, so here's the first, the first one that you can use to give you a very crude estimate. This is the estimate that you give your boss when you're walking in the corridor and he sees you and asks you, you know, how much is it going to cost if we want to produce a new process that would be able to sell product of $10 million? That's our sales we're going to generate. So I've got this much production of benzene, so many kilograms per hour of benzene, Benzene, we know, goes for a certain dollars per kilogram. So I can calculate how much I can sell benzene for on an annual basis. So I know that number. That's an easy number to get. We go to the open market, get the price of benzene. If we're going to produce a plant or create a plant that will produce benzene at X kilograms per hour, how much is that going to cost me? Okay? And you say to your boss, it's going to cost you this much with using this TR number. So TR is a value of 0.5 in the process industries. So if you're going to make a plant that makes annual sales of $1 million, 1 million divide 0.5 is 2 million, it's going to cost you $2 million in fixed capital to create a process that's going to be in the order of selling products for 1 million. That's as simple as it is. Okay? Very, very crude number, obviously because this 0.5 is averaged over the entire industry. It's not just one sector, it's not just oil and gas, it's not just pharmaceutical, it's saying all over all process industries. So from solids to liquids to gases, all types of materials, the average number is 0.5, but it ranges from 0.2 to 4. So there's a very, very wide, large discrepancy. Okay, so essentially this is called a turnover ratio because it's the number of times we can turn around our capital investment into sales. So I'm going to sink a certain capital cost. How many times do I need to turn that around, or how many times do I need to sell my product for to turn around and pay back my capital costs? Okay, so that's why it's called that, and it's a good number to remember. Errors in that number are plus or minus 100%. Okay, so you're going to be pretty far off with that estimate, but a good ball.